The 70s had not been particularly happy years. The wounds from the war in the 60s had healed poorly. The administration was called the most corrupt in history. The economy was sputtering in a series of panics. And to make things worse, Yale was losing regularly to Harvard. Yet behind the gray headlines were glimmerings of great future promise. For the 70s was a decade of ideas that would soon change the face of the country. In 1870, John Hyatt patented celluloid, first of the plastics, to be followed shortly by Joseph Glidden and his patent for barbed wire. From overseas came word of a new curiosity, the four-cycle gas engine. Now, if they could only invent something to put it in. Then the typewriter, the electric light, and the phonograph, and the microphone. And in 1876, the telephone. Professor Bell's dream of transmitting speech through an electrical wire. Bell wrote, the telephone renders it possible to connect every man's house, office, or manufactory. I believe that in the future, wires will unite the head offices of the telephone companies. And a man in one part of the country may communicate by word of mouth with someone in a distant place. Seldom has a prophecy been so close to the mark. It is in ways the grandest American dream ever to come true. In the early years following that first now famous conversation in 1876, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. Bell's dream seems doomed to failure. The editors of Scientific American, among others, dismissed the telephone as a child's toy. The nearly bankrupt backers then try, with no success, to sell all the Bell patents to mighty Western Union. In the first year, most of their income comes from curiosity seekers who pay 35 cents to see Bell and Watson demonstrate this miracle of the age. What the struggling Bell organization needs is a man to move mountains. And they find one, Theodore Newton Vail. Vail enters the picture in 1878 to head the fledgling phone company in Boston. And in the next decade, he wards off patent infringements, introduces an improved telephone instrument, and acquires Western Electric for manufacture and supply. Yet when an overcautious board of directors won't back his plans, Vail leaves the Bell system. Bell's patents expire. Small telephone companies proliferate and vie with each other. Some cities soon have three phone companies. To reach anybody in town, people need three phones, since there is no interconnecting service. Then, in 1907, banking interests gain control of AT&T and persuade Vail to return. He speaks out. Dual and competing telephone systems are wasteful and costly to the user. The public will best be served if Bell and other telephone companies operate with exclusive franchises in given areas as a natural monopoly, conceived in service to the public and subject to public regulation. His rallying cry, one policy, one system, universal service. Universal service available to all in every part of the land and at a price the public can afford to pay. To achieve this goal, he forges the system we know today, with Western Electric as a dependable source of standardized high-quality equipment and the forerunner of Bell Laboratories devoted to innovation in basic telephone technology. The long distance department, someday to be long lines, to handle interconnections between operating companies. With the operating telephone companies responsible for day in, day out, uninterrupted service, connecting people. At first, each telephone is connected by wire with every other telephone. Adding one new customer means running new wires to each existing customer. Then in 1878, 
the solution, a switchboard, with operators who switch the calls, connecting callers through a central office. At first, our long distance lines stretch over 200 miles, but within three decades, lines span 2,000 more miles further west. Then, in January of 1915, the first transcontinental conversation. Bell in New York, Watson in San Francisco, and Vale at Jekyll Island, Georgia. With radio telephony, we get ship to shore, air to ground, and air to air telephone service. The radio telephone leaps the ocean between New York and London. In 1918, the first major transmission breakthrough, four conversations on a single pair of wires, with the introduction of coaxial cable, 600 at a time. Today's coaxial cable carries more than 100,000 conversations simultaneously. The same dramatic improvement is achieved in microwave. First able to carry 2,400 calls in 1950, capacity has been boosted to 16,000 today, and before the decade is out, to 40,000, with data transmission hitchhiking on the same system. All of this using the very same buildings, towers, and the same amount of power as before, and at a far lower cost to the user. The system finds new ways to link people carrying the first undersea cable across the Atlantic in 1956. And again, 10,000 miles across the broad Pacific. Advances too in switching bring us direct distance dialing and today's electronic switching systems, which can, in the wink of an eye, connect any one of 140 million phones in America to any other in any part of the world. 1960, Echo One blasts off. To be followed by Telstar, the first international communication satellite. And for the first time, the heavens link people on opposite sides of the earth to one another. Bell's dream of a century ago, to connect every man's home, office, manufactory. But could even he have imagined that we would reach out in space to bring a message down to earth? In less than 100 years, the telephone network has grown from a single pair of wires into a complex telecommunication system. Each new development, no matter how different, must be compatible with all that has gone before and is still in service. Each must be designed, tested, built, installed, and put into operation with the full assurance everything will work and work together. It must be designed with both the past and future in mind. The result has been unparalleled innovation over the years. From Bell Labs, the transistor, a Nobel Prize winning achievement, which opens a new world of solid state electronics. And in the labs now, scientists are working on waveguide transmission and on optical fibers, which will carry conversations through glass fibers no thicker than a human hair. Innovation the product of Bell System planning and teamwork delivering continuing savings to the public. One integrated system with scientists, engineers, and operating telephone company people working together in the interest of the public and under public regulation. In 1934, the Federal Communications Act is passed by Congress, confirming the concept of natural monopoly in the telephone industry and reaffirming the goals the industry has been striving for. In 1949, the Justice Department brings an antitrust suit against us, challenging the structure of the Bell system and asking that Western Electric be separated from the system. But at the very moment that one branch of the government is charging us with being too big, other branches ask us to undertake missions of national interest. We're given the job of building the dew line, the distant early warning system. We're called on to develop the communications network for Project Mercury, and again for Apollo. The antitrust case is settled in 1956, affirming the present structure of the Bell system. But the challenges continue. 
significant regulatory and court rulings in the 60s and 70s permit others to enter segments of the industry operated by Bell and the independent telephone companies. And in 1974, the Justice Department brings another antitrust suit against the Bell system, again seeking fragmentation. Yet, whatever the challenge, the system conceived and built by Vail continues to work, providing telephone service a presidential task force on communications policy called the finest in the world. During the past century, the people of the Bell system have performed and served under all conditions. We have worked untiringly to provide service where needed, when needed, and to restore service to all those in need of it. February 27, 1975. A devastating fire races through a switching center in New York City, silencing more than 170,000 phones. Before the fire is under control, people from Bell Labs, Western Electric, Long Lines, AT&T, and New York Telephone are already mapping out a plan for restoring service. The system's resources are pooled to meet the crisis. Manpower, technology, and equipment from across the country are mobilized immediately. Nearly 4,000 telephone people work 12-hour shifts seven days a week at the disaster site, backed by thousands more at other locations. A dramatic example of the common planning, common responsibility, and common purpose characteristic of our structure and organization. Spectacular though it is, Bell system performance in this and other emergencies differs only in its urgency from the everyday teamwork and planning of people throughout the system. The same people, coordination, and equipment, an unbeatable combination. There has been, in fact, over the past century, no need too small, no request too large, no problem too difficult to daunt the spirit of service among Bell system people. As a system, we've mastered the challenges of the past century. As a system, we shall meet the challenges of tomorrow. One integrated system, one million people, working together to provide the finest telephone service in the world. One Bell system, it works.